I think we're good to start. Great. All right. Well, uh, my name is Peter Bates. Thank you ever so much for jo uh, joining us today. Uh, this is Ortho Hub's third webinar, so uh, we're just getting started. We've only been open like like four weeks or so, and uh, we're now amazingly we're on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, this is also being streamed on YouTube, so you can uh, uh, watch it and it will be recorded. Mike, we're recording this, aren't we? Yeah, that was a yeah, yes. we are. Yeah. And um, uh, and welcome, and thank you so much for coming along. Um, uh, this is our website, orthohub.xyz. I almost said .com. Uh, Cash would have hung me for that. Uh, orthohub.xyz. It's a, it's it's the idea is free ed orthopedic education for all. This is not about anyone making a fortune. This is just about trying to coalesce a lot of information that trainees and consultants might be interested in over time. And over as as things build, we're looking to build our, our case case reports. And for every one of the cases uh, described today. Uh, these guys up here, these speakers are going to be give little little vignettes on what they did in this situation or what they would have done if they had the chance. We've got awesome faculty here. We've got um, uh, first up is Nima Hadari, second is Alex Vris, and third is Ben Oliver, all limb reconstruction surgeons, all guys well used to uh, uh, sorting out limb deformities, both after fixation, but also after non-operative treatment. The theme today is the sequelae. A non-operative treatment like what happens when non-op goes wrong and that's really what we're talking about although I have to and, and Ben's covering upper limb the other two are covering lower limb I have to say though the first talk Nima's talk we've totally stitched him up because he's got the if you like the boring dry talk which is about assessing lower limb deformity the trouble about lower limbs is they're weight bearing and if you don't get the mechanics right you're, you're never ever going to win and so you have to know before you correct a deformity you have to be able to assess a deformity and for the trainees watching this is the talk that you basically need for the exam the second two talks are all about you know what we can do to correct a deformity what the principles what are what's a good deformity to sort out or a good problem a good reconstructive problem and what's a terrible reconstructive problem so if you're going to do something, what's, you know, what is, you know, it wouldn't be so bad and what is so bad. I've done enough talking. Nima, I'm going to kick you off. Nima is talking about assessment of lower limb deformity. I might butt in halfway through, Nima, just to warn you. Great, great. So uh, do you have to unshare before I share? I think you might have to unshare your screen. Um, uh, just try again and it should be okay. Pete, can you stop sharing? Oh, can you see mine? Yep, you're live. Great. Great, well, um, Pete, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks to the Author Hub team who are uh, Kash Akhtar, Pete Bates and uh, Mike Barrett. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be on here. Uh, so I've got the, the uh, auspices of giving you a talk about uh, limb alignment. Is it important to correct? And actually, exactly as Pete said, we need to know what it's like in normality to be able to get back to it. Um, we've already talked about this. You know, COVID has really concentrated the mind and has brought back different ways of treating fractures that we have, to some extent, forgotten in some circumstances. Uh, so we're seeing a lot more of this. But we have to try and differentiate between what conservative treatment is and what is classed as neglect, either through uh, a variety of things such as access to theatre, patients being too sick to get to theatre, institutional factors, because um, uh, we are geared up to treating the sick patients from COVID and other issues rather than taking uh, fractures to theatres at the moment. The other thing is that people are avoiding um, hospitals. So there are del delays in presentation, as well as this uh, conservative treatment with plasters and other techniques almost becoming a lost art now. So here are some examples of conservatively treated fractures. This lady came to see me. She had a fracture in her teens, which was in the 1970s, and she was treated with traction. Now, 
where does she, you can see that there is an abnormality in her femur, on her right femur. So where does she fit on this spectrum of conservative to neglect? We have another lady. Uh, this lady was uh, in Africa where she sustained bilateral distal tibial fractures. And again, they were treated conservatively. She's now some years down the line from that. You can see on the right side, again, there is a deformity. Where does this fit in the conservative neglect spectrum. And here's another one. A young man fell out of a window, sustained spine injuries, sustained and multiple other injuries, and this was not picked up at the time. And now he has big problems with deformity in his knee and instability. Where does this fit on that? The question that we have to think about is, does deformity actually matter? And what, we, what we're really trying to, um, to try and mitigate is current pain and functional loss. And in some circumstances, how can we mitigate it in the future? Is there any evidence for us to know about this? And the, the thing that I'm going to uh, bring to your attention is some of the information that we have specifically associated with abnormal alignment in knee arthritis, because we seem to have the sort of relatively good data here. Here is a population-based studies, 1,500 people. Uh, and what they found is that if you have either varus or valgus malalignment, and you are a little bit um, wide around the edges, there is a possibility, there is a risk of developing arthritis. There are limitations right? There are limitations. Is this cause or effect? And we don't know about surgery. The thing to recognize, though, is that there aren't any studies telling us that deformity is a good thing. So how do we assess lower limb alignment? And there are some uh, specific things that we have to start off with. We need to have standard radiographs that we use. We have to have a standard method for uh, measuring the alignment. And we have to understand the difference between the mechanical and the anatomic axis. And when it comes to these things, knowing the normal range of values is actually quite important. You know, sometimes you just got to know things. You can't make shit up. And this is where it is important. So here it is. We have got a, a standard X-ray, which is the hip, knee, ankle, um, x-ray, long leg alignment film. The patelli have to be facing forward. There you go. You can see the shadow of the patella through the femoral condyles and it is bang in the center because with rotation, you change the orientation of the limb. Here's a typical one, particularly if you've got rotational abnormalities. Um, I'm not really going to talk a huge amount about rotation because there is a lot to talk about in frontal plane deformity. So, but if you've got rotation, you can see in A, We've got winking patelli, the feet are facing forward, but actually when we make the patelli face out, face forward, that is exactly what we need to get the long leg alignment film right. The difference between the mechanical and anatomic axis is that the mechanical axis is where the load goes through the bone, whereas the anatomic axis is essentially the center of the medullary canal. In the tibia, these two are really very, very similar indeed. But in the femur, you can see how it's different. It goes from the center of the femoral head to the center of the knee joint, from mechanical, and for the anatomic, it is the line where you put your intramedullary nail in. To find the mechanical axis in the long leg film, you need to find the center of the femoral head. And there are a variety of methods that we can use to do that. Software at the moment, there are software for limb uh, alignment measurement, and they come with the circles that you can put over the femoral head and they give you the center. You need to find the center of the ankle joint, which is actually the center of either both bones or the center of the talus, which, is, which actually falls slightly to the lateral of center on the plafond. So here we have a long leg alignment film. This is the x-ray I showed you at the beginning. We find the center of the femoral head, the center of the ankle. We drop a plumb line from one to the other, and we see that it goes through the center of the knee, okay? So this is normal neutral alignment. And I'll give you some more nuances about this in a minute. 
Then we want to we want to assess the joint orientation line. So we draw a line that goes across the articular surface of the femur. This angle here is called the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle. For the tibia, we do the same. We measure, we put a line across the articular surface and the angle here is actually the medial proximal tibial angle. Notice there is no mechanical or anatomic because again, they are exactly the same. A concept that I want to introduce to you as well is mechanical axis deviation. By drawing the mechanical axis, it does fall slightly to the medial side of the center of the knee joint. And there are some publications here for you to show that it is, it is about eight millimeters. Anything under 10 millimeters is said to be normal. And for our case, you can see the uh, green dot is the center of the knee joint and the blue line is the mechanical axis. And here is our mechanical axis deviation. For the deformed side, we do the same. Plumb line from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle. And you can see that the mechanical axis deviation it's, it's the mechanical axis is way to the medial side. This- Please, can, I, Nima, can I just stop you here a sec? Cause, cause I, you know, when, when you put up that, you put up that, that shot right there of the mechanical, the blue line going well medial to the knee, that makes sense to everyone. That's very, yeah. very clear and, and deeply intuitive to an orthopedic surgeon. These, all these angles, these like, these like constant values, if you like, these, uh, you know, mechanical uh, distal femoral angle, the, the, uh, the anatomic angles around the knee, mm -hmm. are these really useful? I think people are going to be wondering, you know, because, because uh, surely there must be a lot of variation in human beings. So, so as short, are they actually accurate? And also, uh, do you find yourself using those? Absolutely. So it's a really good question, Pete. It's a really good question. Um, Actually, these numbers are incredibly important. They are the parameters that tell us what the bones should look like. So if you're engaging in the activity of correcting abnormalities in the bone, you have to really understand what are you correcting it to. And these angles do tell us what's going on. So they are ranges. And I'm going to come to those and I'm going to show you some of these ranges. But actually, for example, in this very patient, we know in normality what she, she needs to look like because she is normal on the contralateral side. So if I was to correct her, I would actually pay very close attention to what the angles are on the normal side and try and then replicate those in the abnormal side. Because okay. by getting these parameters right, you know that you have restored her anatomy. Okay. Great, so really good question. Thanks, Pete. So next, next up, um, and, and you can see that this is deformed, but there are exactly as Pete was saying, there are two sets of parameters. There are mechanical um, parameters and there are anatomic parameters. And here we are. So this is what they are. On the left-hand side of your screen, you can see the mechanical. And on the right-hand side, you can see the anatomic. I'm not gonna talk about the proximal femur angles because actually we are still treating proximal femoral fractures and neck of femur fractures operatively because the consequences of not doing so are profound. So here we are. This is the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle, and it is a range. It is 85 to 90 degrees. It is dependent on the anatomy of the person, how wide the pelvis is, how tall they are. Usually is around 88 degrees. The medial proximal tibial angle is about 87 degrees. Proximal tibia has got a little bit of varus. And the distal tibia has got a little bit of valgus. It's 86 to 92 degrees. With regards to the anatomic angles, here we are, 81 degrees for your anatomic lateral distal femoral angle. The seven degree difference is the valgus angle that you put on your jigs when you do anatomic alignment for your femur, doing your distal femoral cut for your total knee replacement. And here is the difference. But you can see that the uh, tibial angles are actually exactly the same. The purpose of knowing these angles and these angles, what they do is actually they make your joint line parallel to the floor. And this is important. And here it is. This is, this is a, a person standing at ease with the legs slightly apart from the midline. Here, you can see that the joint line is not parallel to the ground, but when you stand into a tension, which simulates the single leg stance, this is where your joint line 
becomes parallel to the ground because the joint is actually bearing more load than the single leg stance. It bears all of your load. Really? So how, how much of a deal breaker is a horizontal joint line? You know, people talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got a, a joint line that's a little bit wonky donkey, does that really, does that create symptoms, do we think? Do we know that? So another great question. The, what we know about this is from the literature, particularly from the knee surgeons and the osteotomists that do joint preservation surgery. And what they do is that they go to correcting it to four degrees of normal, because beyond that, you start putting too much stress on your ligaments and on your meniscus, and patients do become symptomatic. They have pain and they have feelings of instability in their knee. The other issue is that you may also get pain in the bone, which is deformed, which is causing your joint line obliquity. The ankle is also quite sensitive to joint line obliquity. And if you've got an oblique joint line in your ankle, you may well then develop secondary deformities in your foot. So I think that the joints are made to be parallel with the ground. And if we are correcting the anatomy here, we should um, attain a parallel joint line to the ground. Now, another concept that I want to introduce to you from the point of view of nomenclature is the tibiofemoral angle. This is basically, again, mechanical and anatomic, and this is just the line, this is the angle that is between the tibia, the shaft of the tibia, and the femur. Uh, and in fact, interestingly, um, this varies throughout life. And again, this is another thing that when you're talking about normal alignment, the age of the individual, as well as their height and their width and so on, is, is also important. This is a one-year-old. You can see they're very bow-legged. So we start out in life with a varus alignment. By the age of three, we become slightly valgus. And as we mature the skeleton, then we become mild valgus. And this was described by Selenius, again, for the guys going to the, guys and gals going to the exam, it's an important one to know. When it comes to deformities, we have to be able to have nomenclature to describe them. And they fall into four categories, angulation, rotation, translation, lengthening, shortening. And this corresponds to this concept of six degrees of freedom. Now, six degrees of freedom are to do with the X, Y, and Z axis. You can have translation along any of these axes, as well as rotation. And that gives you the six degrees of freedom. So now I'm gonna talk you through assessing a deformity. Here is the uh, one that we've been looking at. We know that the tibia is deformed. We assess the mechanical axis, center of the hip to the center of the ankle. We can see that the mechanical line falls outside the uh, lateral, so it falls lateral to the center of the knee joint. So this is in valgus. So we need to assess the joint orientation to find out where the deformity is. We go from the center of the femoral head to the center of the knee, across the joint line, the lateral distal femoral angle, 88 degrees. This is a normal femur. So we then go to the tibia and we see that here it is, the mechanical axis of the tibia, center of the knee to the center of the ankle, joint line, medial tibial angle, 92 degrees. This is in about overall five degrees of varus. So what we wanna do is we now wanna locate the deformity and locating the deformity, we go through the medullary canal anatomic uh, axis of the tibia. Here it is, we've drawn the uh, medial proximal tibial angle. You can see it goes down the medullary canal. We draw the lateral distal tibial angle. And here we have a tibial deformity of 10 degrees. We can also measure the overall mechanical deformity by making the, um, the line, the mechanical line, go through the knee where we want it to go. Then we draw the uh, distal tibial line and that gives us another um, point of deformity. Now, this may I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. So that's that's your you're, you're creating a core there, right? You're creating your, exactly your right. slightly where your, your center of rotation of deformity is. But how, how, how can it be there? Why is it not where the fracture was? Absolutely. Because our deformity, you can see where the fracture was. OK, you can see because where the callus is, there is an angular deformity here 
and a translational deformity. So you have to do two operations of correcting the angulation and the translation if you were to re-divide the bone through where it was broken before, whereas actually you can do an overall correction of this deformity through a single point of single rotation of angulation. So the, uh, the core, you can do that through there. And we'll come, this becomes very important when we talk about osteotomy rules, which is where you divide the bone and how your correction is affected by doing that. So here we are, the concept of the cora. The cora is the intersection of the proximal and the distal axes of a deformed bone. Here it is, and here is the cora, center of rotation of angulation. By rotating through this one point, we can correct the deformity, all of it. Here is one. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about angulation correction axis, so basically your hinge, but this femoral example is a really good one. So we find the cora, anatomic axis through both of these lines, we see where the deformity is, we put a bisector, a, 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 a line that divides the angle uh, in half, and this gives us the axis uh, for correction of angulation, the ACA, the hinge. Now, why is this important? Because if you divide the bone across that bisector, and then you put your hinge for where you correct the deformity at A on the lateral cortex, you can see that this is essentially a medial opening wedge to correct the deformity. You get collinear correction. If you put it in the center, you have a medial opening wedge, lateral closing wedge. Again, you get collinear correction. And if you put your hinge on the medial side, you have to do a closing wedge osteotomy. Again, you get collinear correction because your hinge is on the bisector line of your cora. Now we come to the osteotomy rules. Now, this is the effect of where you put your hinge and then where you do your osteotomy because you don't necessarily always have the ability to do your osteotomy through the center of the uh, center through where you want to put your hinge through your cora. And here are the three rules of osteotomy. If you put your osteotomy and your cora and your hinge in the same place, that's osteotomy rule one. You get a collinear deformity correction. If you put your cora and your hinge in the same place, but your osteotomy is either proximal or distal, what you do is that you still get, um, sorry, you still get um, correction of your angular deformity and the realignment of the bone, but you will have translation at the osteotomy side. This becomes important, for example, if you do a correction in a distal tibia where the soft tissue envelope is not so forgiving as it is in the thigh, and that can be a problem. So you have to understand what happens. However, if you do your osteotomy at the level of your hinge and they are in a different place to where your core is, you then introduce iatrogenic translational deformity, but you do correct the angular deformity. So really, the take home message is that deformities do cause a functional deficit. And in order to be able to guide your treatment correctly, you really need to have a good understanding of how to assess these deformities. I've gone over a little bit on my time, uh, but thank you very much for keeping with it. Cheers, buddy, thanks very much. Um, uh, so, uh, Alex, I uh, bring in Alex Riss now. Uh, you can share you share your screen, old boy. Um, so, uh, Alex, also a limb recon surgeon. Before you start, Alex, I, you know, uh, we've yeah, we're good. Yeah. Um, before we start, 
uh, Nima's given us some pretty hardcore stuff there about Coras, about three rules of osteotomy and all of that. There'll be people on, on, the, on the chat thinking, yeah, but if I've got a TSF, it, none of this matters, right? It, none, none of it's a big deal. We just like stick a TSF on. Who cares about a bit of translation? Who cares about this? You just keep correcting it until it seems to be lined up and then you just let it heal. Uh, yes, it's correct in one way, but it's a software and a device. Uh, that means that whatever you put in is what you're going to take from it. So shit in, shit out. If you don't know what you're aiming and you don't know what information you're putting in and why you're doing it, it will be very hard to get the outcome you need. So uh, it might be easier if you know what you're doing to do things with a TSF rather than a nail or a little frame, but you still need to know what you're trying to achieve. You might encounter problems that are sometimes irreversible, like yeah. massive translations around the ankle where there's no soft tissue to support, you know, prominent bones and stuff. So yeah. you, you need to know what to expect and you need to be able to tell the patient what to expect. For example, uh, like a violent deformation of, of the skeleton in order to, to, to achieve a good axis might cause a lot of pain. The patient needs to know if it's yeah. an easy fix, an acute fix, that is different for the patient. Great. So yeah, I think it's not fair to start doing those operations if you don't know what you're doing. So essentially, you're right, Pete. <laughs> essentially, you're right, which is that, you know, limb recon surgeons, you know, I'm a limb recon surgeon, you know, we all, we all work around the constraints of the original Lizarov system, which teaches us how to do deformities with a single rotation, same as a single plane deformity. Right? The TSF is a much more powerful system. So you've got, you've got free range of movement. And, and exactly what Alex says is true, which is if you don't understand what you're doing, then you can run into big trouble. But you don't have to be constrained by the old Elizabeth methods with a hexapod, whether that's a TSF or any other kind of hexapod. Yeah. Uh, equally, if you don't understand how to do the simplest correction, you definitely shouldn't be doing the more difficult corrections. Yeah. So for the exam, as a registrar, you should be able to find the core. You should understand what it's about. Um, if you're a limb recon surgeon and you choose to do something a bit left of field, right, they'll settle it in the court. Alex, over to you. Thanks, Ben. So uh, I'm going to uh, leave the theoretical stuff behind and uh, we're going to go through some cases. So the what uh, that coronavirus pandemic has done to our practice is that we uh, treat some patients differently in two ways. We either treat them conservatively, non-op in plasters, and uh, we are not so skilled to do that. We're surgeons, we love to operate, and we have no reason until now to, to treat most of the fractures conservatively. And also, during the current situation, we might need to stop our treatment halfway through because of resources or because the patient got sick with coronavirus, for example. And if we're doing a stage procedure, we cannot do the second stage. So, uh, we, what I'm going to describe is uh, what we anticipate, cases that we anticipate to encounter in the near future, in the next few months. Uh, and I'm going to use as reference cases that we've already done uh, at the Royal London with our team and uh, are similar to what we expect to find. So to start with, uh, like Nima said, uh, conservative treatment is different than surgical treatment. It needs close follow-up. If you see that your fracture has deformed one week after application of plaster because the swelling has gone down in the cast or what, for whatever reason, there are ways, if you pick it up early, to do an old school uh, wedging of the cast and correct your deformity. Uh, you cannot leave the patient, go let the patient go home for six weeks and then see them in six weeks and when it's too late to do anything. Or, like in this case, a 30-year-old polytrauma patient who had an open uh, distal tibia fracture with many, many other injuries, needed a free flap. Uh, th these x-rays are from the first stage where we put an x-fix on a little debridement, plastics did a free flap, and we just put some screws. Instead of K-wires, it's the same amount of metal as, the, as a busy frame. Uh, and we got the anatomy about right, left it in the plaster for reasons... Uh, other reasons, the patient got an infection in her abdomen. We couldn't take her to theater for the next few weeks, but still, because we had done a good first stage, uh, patient's now walking about six months after the injury. 
And, and I guess, Alex, if that had gone on to a non-union in the metaphysis, so let's say the joints heal, but the metaphysis didn't heal, that would fix. have been a fairly easy solution to fix. It's an easy fix because the difficult bit, you've done it. It's, uh, it's uh, the joint restoration. Yeah. And it heals first always. Uh, yeah, so yes, that's absolutely right. Now, uh, we, we anticipate to see less complications related to surgery, like skin problems, infections, and all that. But we expect to see more deformities more non-unions and more soft tissue problems and functional problems. Because if you keep the patient in a plaster, especially an above knee plaster, for example, for too long, they will be stiff, they will be weak, they will lose their balance. And especially for older patients, that's very hard to recover. Uh, I'm gonna focus on deformity and malunion because that's the spicy and interesting bit, the bit for, a, for a Wednesday evening. Uh, so patients with deformities might need to just cope and get the support, the crutches, or the frames for life. But they might do well with simple conservative methods like, you know, heel raises or shoe raises for uh, length discrepancies or um, like minor deformities in around the foot to correct varus or valgus. Uh, and the other end of the spectrum for a patient with a big deformity that's very hard to reconstruct, especially for young fit patients, Amputation might be the best reconstructive option and uh, to get the patient back to work and back to normal life or as close to normal as they can get. In between is where we come and try to correct uh, what is correctable for the right patient. So Nima went through that. A few things about uh, every type of deformity. Angulation in the sagittal plane, the plane of movement of the knee and the ankle is usually well to tolerated. In the coronal plane, varus or valgus, it's not so well tolerated, but if it's not too big, it will be slow to give problems to the adjacent joints. So it will, you will get knee and ankle problems. We have a mid-shaft tibia that's like this one, 10 degrees of virus, but it will take a few years. Um, when the limb is short, that's very annoying for the patient. The patient struggles with back problems usually, is limping, but with a shoe raise, you can balance the limb length. And uh, it's uncomfortable and aesthetically not good, but it really works sometimes. Rotational deformities, uh, the, the uh, caveat here is that they're very hard to assess with imaging. You have to assess clinically and uh, you have to compare with a healthy side if you have it or a normal side, uh, but the clinical input is, is really big. You almost don't need uh, that's an exaggeration, but you almost don't need the imaging. Translation, if it's isolated, it doesn't come with virus or valgus. Again, it's very well tolerated, but usually it comes with shortening in, in uh, cases of, of malunion. Uh, and again, it's slow to give uh, uh, problems to, to joints or back or pelvis. And intraarticular deformities are guaranteed within a few months to give you uh, irreversible changes and uh, uh, problems in, in your knee or your ankle that, that need big surgery to, to sort out. So that's... Can you just go back to that slide a sec? Yeah. So, so just, just running through those, angular deformity, let, let's say that, that various deformity you've got there, what's, yeah. what's that patient complaining of typically? Are they, is, is it, does it hit the ankle, does it hit the knee, or is it just hugely variable? Uh, usually, as you said, it will hit the knee or the ankle. The more distal it is, usually it hits the ankle. The more proximal it is, it will hit the knee. But it, it depends on how it moves the mechanical axis. Uh, but yes, distal deformities tend to affect the ankle. Proximal deformities tend to affect the knee. And what about rotation? So you've got like some, let's say you, you've got a femur there. So you've got a femoral uh, malrotation. Usually patellofemoral joint problems. Patellofemoral. Problems around the knee, but yes, mainly patellofemoral joint. It and doesn't mean that it's only that, but yeah. Usually. And malrotation in the tibia, where does that get you? It's usually at the ankle. The patient needs to, to walk, putting the feet in funny positions to you know, in order to walk. And right. You have symptoms anywhere, but usually, yes, around the ankle. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, this is Nima's uh, patient, the one that he presented. Uh, so uh, Patient complains of uh, pain uh, on the medial side of her knee. We draw the lines, the pain is justified. We find the cora 
And that's, I'm starting from the easy side of the spectrum. So straight bone, it, this part of the bone is meant to be straight. So if you break it and put it in a straight device, like a nail, you've corrected the deformity. No need for too many measurements. And the patient can weight bear straight away. And the patient is happy straight away and they can see uh, the, the result of the operation straight away. Mechanical axis through the middle of the knee, surgeon and patient happy after a few months. Now, this is a bit trickier. 42 year old uh, patient treated conservatively uh, in Africa, uh, said he had this for 20 years, but he tripped and fell and now he's in pain. So either it's a fracture through a malunion or it's always been an union. Regardless, uh, the, the trick here is not to try and separate the two parts of the bone and reconstruct everything because you'll never get the length back and it's very hard to separate the two pieces of the bone. The key is to do one osteotomy through both canals, if you can, the canal of the proximal and the distal fragment, and then just translate the bone. You, easy to make it straight, but you end up with massive shortening. Uh, that, the people watching are thinking, what about that massive lump of bone sticking into his leg? Is it's that, is that pretty well tolerated by the quads and hamstrings? He's had it forever, uh, but the biggest thing is that in order to go and access that, the risk of doing damage to nerves or vessels, I think is much, much worse than, than the actual lump of bone. Uh, I think the patient can easily live with it. I wouldn't go <laughs> looking for it anyway. Yeah, I wouldn't go looking for it. It's the wrong <laughs> place of the body, or <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, but massive shortening, and we have ways to correct shortening. We have lengthening nails. We don't have to do it with old school X fixes, which in the femur are a pain for the patient, almost torture. But they're very expensive, and they're not weight bearing. So the patient needs to be no weight bearing for months, depending on the size of the discrepancy. Now a bit uh, look, the TBI is the same concept: shaft uh, deformities, straight uh, bone. Straight device, we know where the problem is, analyze the deformity, break the bone at the core if possible, straighten it. Two things, you have to break the fibula close to the level of the tibia osteotomy to allow for the correction if it's acute. And also, if you're correcting valgus deformities where you have to push against the muscles on the lateral side, and most importantly, against the, the uh, stretch the common peroneal nerve, you have to either do it very slowly with a frame or release the, the nerve. Otherwise you might get a foot drop. But generally the formula is up to like five, 10 degrees, maybe a bit more. You can uh, correct them acutely and especially virus deformities, uh, easy to correct acutely. Now, going a bit more complex. This patient was a candidate for a knee replacement by one, by one of my colleagues. Uh, and he complained of medial sided knee pain on both knees. Left side was worse because he had an old fracture that was treated uh, conservatively in the Philippines a few years ago. So that's virus, that's less virus. Both knees have uh, early onset arthritis, have, have degenerative changes in, the, in their knees. If you analyze the deformity, the core is there. And the first thing that comes to mind is a uh, high tibia osteotomy, which is easy, acute, uh, and predictable. But with 19 millimeters of open wedge in a 60 year old, and also the translation you have to create because you're away from the Cora, that has a very high expected failure rate. So I decided, uh, it was one of my first big cases to, to do it with a frame and do it gradually and do my osteotomy in a safe place, getting good segments, uh, proximal and distal. And that's the correction. Uh, mechanical axis, although there's translation, like Nima described, if it's away from the cora, the osteotomy is distal to the cora. The patient was so happy that he didn't want to discuss a new replacement on the other side. He wanted the same thing, but I did an HTO because that was the right thing for the other side. Uh, Alex, yes. I yes. just, sorry, just go back to that. So look at that diagram on the right where you've got your two mechanical axes. I notice you've gone for anatomy. A, a lot of 
you know, the intuitively an orthopedic surgeon would think, why not overcorrect a bit? Why not take it a little bit further the other way? Make it a smidge valgus, because that must be good, right? The problem yeah, is there is, let's give him a bit of valgus. He's been resting all his life, right? The latter <laughs> 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 like, So first of all, it's it's wrong with us as principle. I mean, you have to restore anatomy. You cannot, I don't think you're gaining anything by reversing the deformity, you create the same problem on the other side. But also, if you you know that this patient is going to go for a knee replacement, and the left knee now is virgin territory for a knee replacement, almost. If the alignment is perfect, just do your cards, put your prosthesis. No hinges, no fancy um, wedges and corrections. It's, it's a, the, the perfect knee for a, any future procedure. So I think that, yeah, restoring anatomy is important and uh, Overcorrecting might cause problems. I wouldn't do that. I shoot myself in the foot like that, to be honest. Uh, anyway, this is uh, an even more complex patient in terms of decision making. And this is because the patient is 75, she had a stroke, she tripped and fell. She was fully mobile previously, living alone. But because she had that uh, stemmed prosthesis in her knee, uh, she was treated in a plaster. For nine months, the leg was still floppy, no signs of clinical union. Uh, this spike was causing uh, this ulcer in the skin. It was ready to come out of the skin. The skin was black, ready to break down. And you can see that she had a hinge knee replacement and a hip replacement on the same leg. So if this gets infected, a hip disarticulation might be the only option if it all gets infected. Also, patient, old patients with amputations, we know they don't do well. They never walk again. Uh, so uh, the only solution was that. Uh, well, we did a frame, we corrected the deformity without breaking anything, stretched through the non-union. The skin recovered just by correcting, uh, just pulling that spike away from, from the affected skin. And this is the outcome a few months later with a massive apex posterior, which is at the, at the plane of deformity of, of the movement of the ankle joint. So not so much of a problem, but good alignment in the coronal plane. So the patient could walk again. So uh, if you want to brag a little bit about yourself, you save this patient's life, right? So just by making the good decision, making the right decision. Now, another interesting case, that's a 17-year-old uh, boy who had a, a fracture of the tibia tuberosity at childhood, ended up with a short leg with a massive reverse slope. It was about 35 degrees. So short leg, good axis, no varus of valgus, but reverse slope. So the knee was starting to fail. He didn't like the way his leg looked because he had a massive hyperextension. And he spelled this for tilting and he was starting to have back problems. Uh, but again, acutely correcting uh, 35 degrees near the knee is not easy. Also, you will not get the length back. So we did a frame, did it very slowly and got a fantastic, fantastic outcome. Um, now, this is a guy, again, this is... This, I want to point out how important planning is in speaking to the patients. So this is a 42-year-old guy who had a first stage treatment of his uh, Schatzker 6 with one screw and an X-fix. For some reason, he was left like that. And I must say that the mechanical axis is not that bad. He had changes in the MRI and the lateral compartment, but the knee and the ankle were still parallel. So it's hard to, to tell what you need to correct here. Both his tibia are funny shape, a rest shaped. So it's it's not an easy uh, thing to, to, to assess and plan and correct. So uh, we asked the patient and he said he felt that his tibia was had moved sideways. So what we did is do a frame, do an osteotomy, start correcting. And because the, the device is fully weight bearing, we asked the patient how he felt. And all we did was translate his tibia. Uh, and when it came to that point, he felt really good. So when the mechanical axis came there, he felt like his knee had absolutely no problem. And that's just by listening carefully to the patient and not rushing into uh, decisions. Also using a device that can you can rewind. So you can correct if it doesn't feel good, you can rewind it a little bit. 
or tweak it a little bit. And that's the beauty of the TSF, what you said before, when you know what you're going for. Closer to the ankle joint now, this is a neglected uh, Weber B that with a fibula heel short, that's Nima's case. And uh, you always compare with the healthy side and that was in about nine degrees of valgus compared to the other side. Both sides are in valgus, the, the left side was more. So with an acute closing wedge, supramalar osteotomy, restoration of anatomy, good patient outcome. When all, sometimes when you have irreversible changes, or when you think you will not offer anything, but because there's no deformity, there's just irreversible damage to the ankle joint, you can go to a more uh, hardcore reconstruction, an ankle replacement, or even an ankle fusion, which gets rid of the pain, you lose some function, but the outcomes are relatively good and predictable. So coming to the knee, and I'm almost there now, I'm almost finishing. Uh, the classic problem we have with neglected uh, proximal tibia fractures is that posterior, posterior medial condyle that uh, collapses and the knee goes into fixed flexion and virus. And uh, sounds like, you know, like a risky approach for some people, but it's not so difficult as long as you know what you're doing. You're elevating and fixing the condyle in the right place. And that way you can restore a simple intraarticular deformity. So just the posterior medial condyle falling back. When you have more complex deformities uh, with new technological solutions, that's, that's again uh, one of Nima's cases that he did a few months ago. Uh, we have the option to print out the joint, practice our osteotomies and see what works. And uh, you get a femoral head, you fashion your wedge the way you want, you fashion your plates the way you want, and uh, doing it carefully and taking your time like a skilled carpenter that Nima is, you can get an amazing correction and a good result. When things are beyond salvage, again, a uh, knee replacement is the way out. Now, just one slide for soft tissue problems after neglected injuries. This patient had a fixed equinus after a soft tissue injury uh, in her leg. The, tr uh, the trick here is to put a plaster at 90 degrees. When you put a plaster in a &E and you're in a rush and you try to just get rid of the patient, you put it in equinus, that deformity is very hard to correct. You start trying with physio. If this doesn't work, soft tissue procedures, Achilles tenotomy, soft tissue releases. If that still doesn't work, you can correct this slowly with a frame, get a good correction, get a good outcome. So in summary, conservative treatment is not neglect. It doesn't mean you, you need to follow up the patient more closely than you would if you had operated. Careful planning and assessing the deformity and, uh, is key. And also think of what you want to achieve. Not, not the extra you want to, you don't want a perfect correction and a poor functional outcome. So this patient, her life was saved and she was back to walking with, uh, with a Zimmer frame. This patient, I lengthened because of a 2.5 centimeter discrepancy and I malrotated the femur and gave him such a bad knee um, stiffness that he almost couldn't walk. So perfect x-ray, very bad outcomes. So we have to be careful uh, what we're aiming for. And I'm going to leave you with a nice correction because I didn't want to leave you with the previous one. And that's me. Uh, Alex, that was, that was great. Uh, one of the questions that came up before we quickly whip on to Ben is uh, that that distal fe uh, uh, proximal tibial um, uh, uh, deformity you put up, um, which you were you reluctant to an HTO because it was such a big deformity in a sixty year old. Yes. Uh, one of the questions was, could you do a um, do a, 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 a an HTO, a smaller HTO, and a DFO as well? So like have double osteotomies. Give them so, a floating knee. Yeah. So this will restore your mechanical axis. It will fall through the middle of the knee, but your joint line will be oblique, so you get shearing forces. Right. Yeah, so what I mean. It's one problem for another. Exactly. 
Yeah. And always you have to correct the deformity that you have. It's it's a it's a very it's a it's a trap to to go for correcting another deformity to to correct you know to create a deformity to you know yeah to, to, to correct add. yeah to, yeah sort another one out. That's a last resort. It's not it's not what you should be aiming for. Right. Nima, do you need to add anything? Uh, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, it's because, I mean, the whole point of doing a deformity analysis is you've got to find where the deformity is and correct it. There are many circumstances where you do do double osteotomies for knee arthritis, but then you have to be measuring your femoral and tibial angles with the aim to restoring the joint line as being parallel to the ground. That's really important. Great. Benno, we're moving straight on to you, old boy. Um, just conceptually speaking, just just keep this general for a second. What's the in terms of deformity deformity correction? Is it really just about weight bearing? Is that really the difference between upper and lower limb? Is it purely about weight bearing, or is, is there a bit more nuance to it than that? There's a lot more nuance to it than that, Pete. As as you know, um, <laughs> the um, you know the aims are completely different. So you need to remember that despite what everyone else will tell you, the whole point of the upper limb is to put your hand in space, right? So you can eat and you can wipe your ass. That's, that's, that's basically it. Um, so stability is all in the upper limb, range of motion, not quite so much. Um, in the lower limb, you know, it's mostly about pain relief and mobility. Um, so there are times when you do, you know, discussion about double osteotomy. Well, the time you do double osteotomy for me is, is in these big congenital deformities where, where in order to get both pain relief and stability, you need to rotate the knee inwards or outwards or, or something like that. Mostly in the upper limb, it's post-traumatic, it's unstable. It's, I'm not going to talk at all about any kind of congenital stuff. It's, you know, this is, this is all about COVID, isn't it? It's all about neglected, neglected yeah. stuff. So we'll That's kind right. of suck it and see and interrupt me by all means. I'm not, uh, I've not put together such a cerebral talk. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of fun, tell you a few things that I think, and um, we'll see where we go. So can you, first thing is, can you see my screen now? Yeah, it looks totally Ooh, awesome. Yeah. Might want to just press, uh, yeah, yeah. That um, one? Yeah, yeah. Boom, boom. Okay, Hello. so I'm, I'm talking about the upper limb um, and uh, I'm going to talk about post COVID problems specifically. Um, and I'm talking about benign neglect. So one of the things that we fail to do in the upper limb really, I guess, um, is that it's one of those areas where mostly in a lot of hospitals, it's dealt with by elective surgeons with an interest in trauma in that area. And so there's not much in the way of reconstruction and deformity correction uh, goes on and it falls to, to the limb recon surgeon often to put things right. And that sometimes can skew your view of the world. So couple of bits of advice first. This is a factual film, which some of you may have seen about some events from 2000 years ago. Um, and it's important to remember that, you know, we all think we're amazing, but each individual surgeon uh, has their own views. So whoever it is that you send your, um, send your uh, referrals to. Remember that person's just a surgeon like anybody else, that they may feel that they uh, have the answer to life, the universe and everything. But in the upper limb, you can solve things in the same way as you can in the lower limb, simply with principles. The other thing to remember is, is Bob, who's a personal hero of mine, because Bob's an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, you know, can we fix it? Yes, often we can, but sometimes we need to remember, no, it's fucked, right? So this applies to those, um, those cases and those problems that you can fix, but sometimes, best thing to do is nothing at all. What we're doing with COVID to my mind in the upper limb is um, we're not changing how we're treating things, we're just kicking the can down the street. So we're taking things that we really know deep down in our hearts we ought to operate on. Most of them are quite conservative in the upper limb and we're kind of leaving them in plaster, we're kind of saying they'll be all right. Sometimes we're discharging them in the hope they'll turn up in somebody else's clinic. But we are basically garnering up a lot of pathology, particularly around the elbow, potentially the distal radius. That's what I'm gonna talk about most. And I love this slide, right? It's not my slide, so don't shoot me for it. Um, it's from Thesaurus, thesaurusplus.com. What's the opposite of floppy? Well, the opposite of floppy is stiff, erect, firm, strong, inflexible, rigid, and tense. Well, what I really want for my patients is if I've got to choose one or the other, I want my elbows stiff, erect, and firm, right? Because if you've got a solid upper limb, you can do something with it, you can grasp things, you can lift, you can move things. Uh, anything that's floppy and unstable is no good. It's no good to the patient. 
is difficult to sort out. And I think what we're going to end up seeing is a lot of patients with their soft tissue injuries being managed non-operatively. We're going to have a large amount of disability uh, with the uh, unstable elbow. So just to recap, in order to get function in the elbow, you need a range of motion from 130 degrees to 30 degrees. That's all. Not from zero to 150, which is the more normal kind of range of motion. You just need 30 to 130. And in terms of pronation and supination, you just need 50 degrees in either direction. The reason for that goes back to what I said at the start. It's about positioning your hand in space. And you get 95% of the locations in space you can position your hand if you've got that range of motion. So we shouldn't be doing stiffness releases. We shouldn't be doing any of those things for patients for a 30 degree terminal extension loss. That doesn't help them. It makes them look better in the mirror, but it doesn't help them. Okay, first thing. So just talking very briefly about stiffness, you will see stiffness no matter how well you do your surgery. These are obviously not post-COVID patients. You can see this guy's had a terrible triad. He's ended up with a huge amount of esotopic ossification. And it's a relatively simple thing. Somebody does it quite a lot to take it away. So I'm not bothered about stiffness. I'm not even bothered about this kind of stiffness. This is a patient who uh, has significant soft tissue loss. They've been treated uh, perhaps not as one would choose to treat their elbow. Um, uh, this, this might have been one of yours, Pete. Was this one of yours? I don't know. It was an uh, yeah, anonymous referral. Yeah, I mean, that looks like a pelvic surgery elbow, doesn't it? Right? We you do that really stuff all the time. Works really well. There. Yeah. And you probably call that an inflix, would That's you? Great yeah. results in my hands. Absolutely. I mean, it's brilliant, right? It's stable. It's in joint. Yeah, lovely, right? So if you've done something like this, don't then bury your head in the sand for a long time because it's only going to get worse. And then what we had was a very, very stiff elbow. A patient who really functionally was not functioning very well at all was left for a little bit longer and then sent to me. So this is probably the worst, stiffest elbow I've ever seen, okay? Um, and this is a patient who actually was functioning okay. And when, when you talk to her, she's got a completely unclosed elbow. The difficulty she's got, she's got, other, she's got other injuries elsewhere. She can't pronate, she can't supinate. So she's obviously had a flat reconstruction. You can tell by these little signs of the devil here sitting on the, sitting on the x-ray. Um, so after a lot of discussion, we, we decided to go in and we did a limited release and you can see that I've taken her radio head out and I've released her forearm. So she can now pronate and supinate. And she's got about 15, 20 degrees of range of motion. That's enough for her. She's not asked for anything else. So from a stiffness perspective, remember a stiff upper limb is potentially quite functional and you can make problems by diving in and doing anything. Ankylosed forearm, entirely different. An ankylosed forearm you've got to deal with because a patient can't pronate and supinate. They can't open jars, they can't use a computer. You know, they can't even wipe their ass. You know, there's a lot of stuff you can't do if you can't rotate your forearm. Okay, so that's the only thing I'm gonna say about stiffness. So in terms of managing these patients, which I predict we're gonna have, um, I'm gonna go through four-ish commandments. So I was given the whole hour I'd ask for, there are probably 10 of these, Pete, but you know, I'm gonna, gonna go for four, sticking with, the, um, sticking with the Life of Brian theme. So first thing is, remember when you see a patient, like. Speak to them for fuck's sakes, right? Don't just ignore what they're saying, stare at the x-ray, mutter something and tell them to, to wander off and come back again in six weeks once seeing the physio. The second thing is that you really need to know what you're aiming to achieve. If you don't know what you're aiming to achieve, you'll go in, all guns blazing, you'll discharge the patients you can't help, you do operations and make people worse. You know, this is about judicious surgery when things haven't gone quite right. The third thing is always start in the right direction. And the fourth thing is, do remember, sometimes you might not be the person to do the operation. And maybe, you know, I refer stuff on. I'm sure the whole panel refers stuff on, you know, and sometimes I refer stuff on to a friend. And they send it back to me and they say, do it yourself. Fuck's sake, this looks terrible. Um, and, and that, again, is an important thing to remember. So I'm going to take you through a couple of these. First, ask the patient. So this is the patient that we put up. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about this. So this is, this is my lady. She's a 21-year-old girl, um, the fall at the gym. Um, what I didn't tell you is she's pretty active. Um, she is a, um, uh, was a world champion. Um, you just couldn't even jump out an airplane with one of those uh, things strapped to you. Um, wing suitor, wing suitor, that's the one. Um, and uh, she's a rock climber as well, right? Um, so when I saw her, the information you didn't have on the, on the case was she's apprehensive test positive, no medial bruising not possible test for PLRI. She'd been seen by a colleague about three or four weeks ago and had wangled her way back to fracture clinic having been discharged based on those x-rays. So this to me is a sort of typical COVID patient we might be seeing maybe a bit further on down the line. So we asked for some thoughts and 40% of you said um, more investigation CT scan. 19% uh, of you said uh, non-up in a sling seen a week 
hopefully someone else will see it, you know, get the can down the street, maybe they'll make a decision. Um, 19 of you said, uh, you know, pop it in a plaster um, and uh, x-ray in a week. And 16% said uh, non-op sling. So the only one I really mind on that, really the two I mind is the, is the non-op sling and discharge, right? Cause you, you can't do that. Can't do that until you have all the information. And the second one is never, ever, ever put an elbow in a plaster, right? It doesn't help. Sometimes pulls them out of joint, cons the patient thinking you're treating them so they don't come back and say, no, saw this guy and he gave me this terrible treatment or this lady, she gave me this terrible treatment. They don't come back because they think you've done the right thing. So don't put them in a plaster, right? And the advice I think was, was pretty good. So why do I think that all of those answers about the EUA in theater are suboptimal and I think the other two are probably causing the patient harm? Well, elbow instability is a dynamic thing. Um, and the way that we need to think about it is what's the cause? Is it ligament? Is it bone? Is it both? And we need to think really simply about whether it's the treatment is operative or non-operative. That's all you need to think about for the exam. Not everything needs operating on. So if you ask the patient, she'd pull her iPhone out and say, here's a picture of me falling. Isn't it funny? Somebody took a, took a picture. And for the lower limb surgeons in the room, you can see that that kind of right arm there is pointing backwards, right? So, so the arm is supposed to point forwards and that arm is pointing backwards. And that is a typical dislocation picture. You can see she's rotated entirely on all of her medial structures, right? So that is a, an almost subtotal amputation of the soft tissues in her upper limb. And she's come in with this pretty congruent looking x-ray with just some subtle signs was treated non-operative and would have done horrendously badly had she been left. Okay, so let's look back at our x-ray so we don't make that mistake again, because that's a crucially important thing to do. So if you look on this x-ray, quite subtly, you can see that there's a seagull sign there. So the coronoid doesn't quite match the trochlea. Yeah? It's open slightly on the medial side. You can see when you look on the radial head, that in fact, there's a slight depression on the joint line. And you can also see there's a little flake of bone there. And those are all subtle signs that tell you that the patient probably isn't quite right. You're making a face, Pete. I'm, I promise you, like, these are genuine signs. And if you, uh, if you see these, you should definitely phone a friend. I totally, um, I totally get it, Ben. I, I'm loving it. But, but I, I just know what you've got, you've got 119 people watching this. And they're, yeah. they're thinking, Jesus, I, I probably would have missed that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's why, so this is why I don't like the put them in a sling and discharge them, right? Because actually yeah. it's really difficult to assess this elbow. So if the patient's got but a huge- also, but also there'll be, there'll be skeptics saying, okay, fine. So this lady ended up, maybe she ended up with a bit of instability, but actually th that could have worked out just fine. Well, she came back because her elbow was dislocating. So she definitely had some, some instability. So sure. She, yeah. So I think the, I think that the key thing for me here, and I think this is where people miss it is, they don't get the arm out of the sling. So had I seen this lady, I didn't see her early on. Have you seen her early on? We've all seen this, right? You look at the outside of the arm, it all kind of looks all okay. And you take the arm off and you look on the inside and on the inside, you've got this massive amount of bruising all down the inside. So that's the clinical sign is that you see this massive medial bruising. And this lady absolutely will have had this because she was completely unstable. And also like talking to the patient, right? I mean, didn't take me two minutes to say to her what happened. She pulled the phone out and said, this happened, you know? And you yeah. sort of, Think, well okay fine you know and if yep. you talk to them they'll often give you the give you the information and you know this woman had her elbow relocated where she was in the sports center and um you know it's it's an easy thing to miss but it's just worth bearing in mind i think they definitely need that safety net if ben, you're not you just, sorry sorry ben sorry to interrupt you again could you just um just describe your your examination of her so you you've lifted her up and say, oh my god yeah, medial so, yeah, so if, you see them, if you see them acutely obviously yeah. it's are they peripheral neurovascular intact yeah and then it's do they have a big medial side can you see that they've got a big medial bruise you can yeah. often see a massive joint effusion over the lateral side if you look carefully you know yeah. just where just in that little soft spot behind the radial head there you can see yeah. it kind of bulging often that's a good sign you've got a big joint effusion Often these patients don't have much pain because they've torn their capsule in entirety and often they can, uh, they can basically flex and extend their elbow without too much difficulty, but they'll often hold on to their arm in order to do so because they yeah. feel it's unstable. And the crucial thing to just ask in the patient, you know, does your elbow feel unstable? Yeah, yeah, okay. Imaging doesn't help you. And a lot of these patients have poor proprioception. So they will come back sometimes with their elbow having dislocated without knowing it if you see them a week for a check x-ray. Um, so initial assessment, that's, that's roughly where I would be. Yeah. 
but you're not you're not trying to do a PLRI or anything like that. No, yeah. not immediately, no. So, no, no. so I think okay. these are patients who it's it's exactly like a multi-ligament injury of the knee, right? It's rarer, but that's what it is. And we all know those patients, you either get a scan or you yep. bring them back to check you've not missed something horrendous. And that's basically what you should do. I happen to think scans around the elbow are terrible. So therefore you should bring them back to make sure you've you've not missed something horrendous. I think right. that's, that's that's basically basically entirely where we are. Okay, moving on, because I was going to be talking for, for ages. So if you've decided the patient needs to have a reconstruction, you've then got to work out where you are on the reconstructive ladder. So for me, if you catch them early, they get a ligament repair and bone repair. And try as you might, you've really got to try and do that if you can. If you can't repair the bone, sometimes you need to put a prosthesis as a radial head prosthesis. And then I do about three or four hamstrings repairs a year. Uh, there's some extra anatomic repairs you can do for me. That's a compass hinge because I'm a frame surgeon. Um, and if you can't do that or you can't get them stable, you put an X fix on. So that's the kind of acute thing. And actually the delayed thing is exactly the same. The, um, you know, you, you're aiming basically to allow them to rehab. So you to go however far up that ladder you need to in order to get them to do immediate passive flexion extension and immediate active pronosupination because you need them to get stable, okay? I leave active assistance until four weeks because they don't have that proprioceptive. I work with the physios in clinic with me the whole time and that's important. And if they've had a repair or not, they avoid torsional loading of the upper limb essentially for three months because that's, that's the time that you tend to end up with micro instability, PLOI, that sort of stuff. If they get stiff, night splints from about six weeks, okay? Um, so that's, that's the sort of aim. So let's talk a bit about how you might achieve that and what the pathology is. Because I know people get very confused around the other. And that's because people look at diagrams like this. And you kind of look at the diagram and everything's really messy and it's all ligaments. You look at it and you think, fuck, you know? Like that basically is for the MRCS and FRCS and what's that got to do with my practice? That's what but I'm thinking. What you need is you just need to remember five structures, basically. Okay, so the stabilizers for valgus, there's one soft tissue one, the anteromedial portion, the medial collateral ligament. I've colored that in red for the hip surgeons. Yeah. And then the radial head here, yeah, that's the bony stabilizer. If your bony stabilizer is gone and your soft tissue stabilizer isn't, you'll fall into valgus without too much difficulty. If your soft tissue stabilizer is gone and your bony stabilizer isn't, You'll be able to stretch out the medial side. Same pathology, but but different different mechanism. Both of them are gone. You lose entire valgus stability. Same with varus. You've got the radial collateral ligament and the anterior portion of the coronoid. Uh, and then in terms of um, rotation and translation, you've got the capsule. Okay, so let's just look at what happens. So if you've got a, um, I've talked about that already. If you've got a lateral injury like this lady has, um, the first thing that happens is that you get you, um, you get your valgus strain, okay? So your radial head impacts on the uh, capitellum and you end up with this seagull sign here, which is seen just on the, uh, the coronoid and the, and the trochlea. Um, in order for that to happen, for simple dislocation, you detension the lateral structures, the elbow comes into valgus, you get a tear often first on the lateral side in order for the radial head to move out. The radial head starts to sublux. That's why you get those little impaction fractures. And then the strain is entirely on the anteromedial portion of the medial collateral ligament. You rotate around that, the radial head continues, and often you'll end up at that point with the coronoid coming off. That's when you end up with a complex instability. Okay. Then you've got the capsule. You suddenly run out of space. Everything's moved backwards and there's this thick capsular attachment anteriorly. So one of two things happens. You either get, at the top picture, you get a capsular rupture, well, the bottom picture, you get a capsular rupture and what's described as an avulsion injury to the, to the coronoid. And that's because they got it wrong when they described it, okay? Because the capsule inserts distal to the tip of the coronoid. It's not an avulsion injury. It's the humerus coming anterior and knocking it off. So you know if you see that, it's not an avulsion. It's a sign of a significant dislocation. It's actually complex dislocation. It's ligament and bone. If it's complex, you've got to put both back. Simple, you can sometimes manage conservatively. Okay, does that make sense? Yep, so it's a progression. You've got these structures. Doing it the other way around, it goes the other way, okay? So talking about our young lady, you can actually see now exactly what's happened to her elbow. She's rotated around on her medial structures, which is the strongest, and then she's pulled them off. And you can see that looking at this picture. Okay, you can see everything twisted around. You can see the structures 
pulled off. So what do we do? Well, I think the best thing to do with these patients is to take them to theater and to screen them if you're not sure. So I screen at each stage. I didn't save the screening pictures for this lady's elbow all the way through. You can see I've already done the anteromedial, uh, the anteromedial ligament here. You can see there's the drill holes through, and this is a stress view. You see she's still luxating, but she's not dislocating, whereas she was dislocating when I first started a UA in her. So I've not done enough. I need to continue my, my progression. So what do I, how do I do it? I will do the anterior capsule first and anterior medial ligament first, always on a lateral injury if it's gone, because that's the strongest primary stabilizer. You get that right. First thing you go around like a clock face. So then if you still got valgus instability, you then need to repair the radial head. So I've repaired a radial head. There's no double shadow there. A couple of little safe scaphoid screws. It's all sorted. Next thing I'll do is I'll come to the lateral ligaments. You can see I've taken a lateral ligament origin. There was a little flake of bone that you could see before. I've moved that up and I've repaired her lateral ligaments. And then finally, we've done the, the ulnar lateral ligaments there because she was still unstable. So this lady had a full house and she's now stable and she's, um, she's had a clockwise <coughs> approach. And that's the word you need to use in the exam or when you're, when you're thinking about it and you're screening them, you need to think about starting in one side. It doesn't really matter where you start. For me, it's always anteromedial ligament, progressing round with the direction of the deformity and repairing structures one at a time until you've got it stable and you EUA it each time. So that's it for, for stability and um, delayed presentation from my perspective. So next thing, know what's needed. Another couple of quite short cases, so we finish on time. This is a 92 year old lady, um, distal radius fracture. She lives relatively independently, Pete, better supported living. What's the management for you? Need to unmute, mate. You've done this before, right? You do it every week. Uh, uh, well, gave so I was just I was just doing something else. Uh, Non-optic treatment uh, we, we need, needs a good cast though. So th so this yeah. is not the position we want it to be in. If you if you just put a plaster on there, it will tend to deteriorate. And yeah, that's non-optic treatment from there. It really isn't isn't a great a great starting point because that volar cortex isn't hitched. So that her, her ulnar variance will be huge right now. And this is a this is just a really bad start. It is it is, and she's she's pretty good. So she's one of those people who's had bodily failure but cognitive function, right? Yeah. And um, so this was where she was. This was where she was when she came to see me at six months, having been discharged from, it might even been my clinic actually by a registrar without another x-ray. You know, she's, so she's 92. This I think is what we're going to see with COVID actually. That's why I've chosen this particular patient. Um, so she's 92. She comes in and she's basically, she's got a whole lot of medical comorbidities. No one wants to put her to sleep. And she's saying like, my life's over. I can't do Sudoku because um, she's an avid expert Sudoku player. It turns out this woman. And, um, you know, I, I can't actually play with my grandchildren. I'm too weak to lift them up anyway, but she comes with this kind of floppy arm that does this the whole time, right? She can't feed herself. Mentally, she's all there and she's become completely dependent. And um, so, you know, this is, this is about knowing the right thing for the patient. This woman said to me, you know, I'd actually rather die than be like this because this is my dominant hand and I can't do anything. I can't participate in anything that's important to me. And I think when assessing these patients, questions you should be asking about participation, you know, what's important to you? What can't you do? What can you do? Um, and so, so at 92, I, you know, I did a dorsal approach. I did an osteotomy and um, put everything back and, and fixed her up. Um, and she's now, she's got a stable, uh, stable wrist. Um, I looked on the system for her latest x-rays. That was at about nine months after her osteotomy. She doesn't appear to have died from COVID according to our, um, according to our PAC system. So um, hopefully she's still doing well, but I've not seen her for, for a year and a bit. Goes back to that floppy thing, doesn't it, Ben? That floppy thing of yours. Yeah. Not, not that, not that one. But, but uh, yeah, absolutely, no, no one wants the floppy, do they, Pete? Right? No one wants the floppy. <laughs> yeah, but and you know, and, and this lady, you know, you're absolutely right. And this is what worries me about COVID, right? So this patient basically has had benign neglect. She's not had non-operative management. She's been stuck in a plaster. Somebody's looked at her, gone, "You're 92. Like, it doesn't matter what your outcome is." But actually, this is an outcome that could have destroyed destroyed the remains of her life. Um, so that's it um, for her. The next of my golden rules, if you're dealing with um, dealing with complex upper limb things, is make sure you use the right approach because um, you know there are a lot of um, there are a lot of approaches out there. There are a lot of things that people do, and the problem with the elbow and the wrist is you can't really access the other side, right? So whatever you, wherever you start is where you're stuck. Um, so this is a lady again. I think this is a potential COVID um, 
COVID problem. She's a supercondylar fracture. She's in her in her mid forties. Somebody thought would manage her non-operatively. Didn't really notice the significant elbow injury there. She is at around about twelve weeks, right? Stiff as a board, um, but also you can get stiff instability. So this is a lady who's stiff, but also can't use her arm because everything's kind of out of out of the way. Um, there's a CT scans. And the key thing here is to, is to know your approaches and start in such a way that you can do your progressive osteotomy in the right way, get everything back to where it should be and fix it up as, as, as quickly as you can. Um, the, final, the final thing really is just knowing sometimes when, when not to play. Um, so uh, this is a patient who was, who was treated non-operatively with a very rare injury, which is an annual ligament injury. She came back to see me at around about, um, around about uh, four months after her injury and discharge with this dislocated radial head, having been told there wasn't much that, that could be done about it. Um, and she ended up having annual ligament reconstruction and is now quite stiff because of the time that her joint was out, but actually she's, she's 22 or so, she's working, she's doing all right because she's now got a stable but stiff arm, whereas before she had a stiff but unstable arm. So there's a third category key, there's the, uh, there's the stiff and floppy. So final thing, take two minutes um, is, um, Again, on the sometimes when not to play. So this is somebody who was uh, managed um, operatively by somebody who probably didn't quite have the skills to manage this difficult fracture um, and hung on to them for a bit. Uh, and what you've got there is a, you know, a transalecranon fracture dislocation of the elbow. And, and the crucial thing here is that, you know, if you look at the radial head, it's out, right? And the joint's not where it should be. So you get your CT scan, you find half the joint's driven in. The coronoid is, um, is still uh, essentially um, still essentially non-united and uh, dislocated. So this guy ended up having to have an osteotomy. Although on the surface of it, this doesn't look that much better than where he started from the joint line perspective. It's a huge difference to him in terms of the congruency of his joints. So look at where his radial head is and where his, where his capitellum is. So what he's got now is he's got a stiff, reliable elbow rather than anything else, um, which, you know, he's still got the same range of motion but he's now stable and therefore happy, whereas previously he was unhappy. Final thought, don't forget you can put frame on anything and infection burns in the fire of the regenerate, as Elizabeth said. What a crock, what a crock. <laughs> <laughs> Benno, thanks very much. Oh, ben, That's great. In That's Russian, great. we said it. Um, can you unshare your screen, Ben? Uh, yeah, so I click stop share, will that do it? Got him, got him, nice, nice. All right. Um, cheers, guys, that was great. Um, sorry. Uh, that was great, thank you very much. That was, that was excellent. Um, uh, awesome faculty. I hope that was clear. I hard tried to ask questions that I thought that, you know, if I was watching this, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be wondering about. There's not a huge amount in the Q&A and, and Nima's been picking those up as we go through. Um, uh, I just want to talk about so before I, I'm just going to give you a little summary of what my take home messages were from that that Q and A uh, from, from from those those talks. But I just want to uh, give a little plug for our up, upcoming webinars next week. We've got orthopedic research. We've got Dan Perry and Xavier Griffin, like two awesome guys. Neither of them like research is like the most boring thing ever, right? But they're probably two of the least boring people you'll ever meet. So I, I, that's going to be really exciting. Same same time next week. Uh, that should be fun. And I, I'm, there's, there's, there's going to be gags of plenty. It should be quite a good laugh. Uh, and then the following week, we're doing well-being. Massively fashionable these days. If you're not talking about well-being, you're, you're nothing. Personal resilience, calm, clarity, common sense in a, in a piece and all of that. So uh, that's the week after, 27th of May. I'm going to finish up. Guys, feel free. If I miss something out, just feel free to interrupt me. But here's my my summary of what I've heard today, and then we're going to clock out. There are two things which came up again and again and again, and that's and, and it's these two: non-operative versus neglect. And, and we, we we started on it and we finished on it. And, and Ben put up that lovely 90-year-old lady with who basically got a neglected wrist fracture rather than non-operatively treated one. And Nima started his talk right at the outset with uh, various neglected fractures. So if you're going non-operative, that is not doing nothing. It is not seeing him in six weeks. It is doing something, but it just doesn't happen to be on operation. 
And good temporization is another thing. Alex showed us a beautiful example of a distal tibial pilon fracture, which was intra-articular, and he, put, he just put nuts and bolts together and then put it in a spanning X-fix. And magically, three months later, it all healed. But I tell you what, that would never have worked if the X-fix had fallen to bits at two weeks. So when we talk about good temporization, it's about putting on good, solid X fixes, not quick like bish bash bosh, stick them on and we'll be fine, okay? If you, when you're in a constrained environment, actually spending a bit more time to make that X fix really strong and solid is time well spent. Nima talked about assessment and deformity. Oh my God, I'm glad I didn't get that talk because it's so potentially dry and I'm, Nima, I'm sorry we fucked you with that, but, uh, he talks about mechanical versus anatomic parameters. Yeah, so the me mechanical is the stuff that seems to make sense. The anatomic stuff is you've got to know the angle because they are useful. I challenged him on this. Are they really useful? They are useful. They give you a starting point because deformities can be hard to work out and having numbers that start you off well is helpful. Horizontal joint line, uh, that, that got revisited a couple of times. Mechanical axis goes just medial to the middle point of the knee and we don't try and overcorrect it when we're going after deformity, we go for anatomic, not overcorrection. Six degrees of freedom, concept of a cora. A cora, remember, is not just the middle of the fracture because there may be a translational element. So when you, when you go to the cora, you're doing the rotational bit and the translational bit all in one, okay? And we talked about osteotomy rules. Those have already flown out of my head, but that's something to learn for the exam. Hexapods, powerful devices. Uh, when you compare them with the Lizarov, because it's like, you know, uniplanar versus multiplanar capability. They're incredibly powerful, but if you don't understand the nerdy stuff, the rules of osteotomy, you will fuck it up. And that's why I don't put on, is a, uh, uh, why I don't put on hexapods. Deformities and how they're tolerated. Uh, uh, Alex gave us a lovely example of uh, those six degrees of freedom, freedom demonstrated in bones. Straight bone, which is bent, that really lends itself to a nail, right? Obvious, and of course you can lengthen them at the same time if need be. Periarticular, by, by that I mean just outside the joint, uh, lots of decisions to make. There's, there's particularly around the tibia, you've got soft tissue concerns as well. And listening to the patient, what, what do they think? That came up in the upper limb as well. Listening to the patient, what do you think the deformity is? What do you think's wrong with your arm? What do you think's wrong with your leg? Don't try and correct stuff that they're not complaining about. And once you get intra-articular, it's, it's pretty tough. And arthroplasty is always on the menu and 3D planning and practicing it and like making six plastic bones and chopping them all and see which ones works best and work out how big your bone graft needs to be is that's, that is planning. That's what planning looks like. Correct the deformity you have in front of you. Don't make a new one. We talked about double osteotomies to create a problem down here. And what you will end up doing is tilting your joint line and so you correct one problem for another. Upper limb. Uh, dip, down, uh, 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 Ben's going to be annoyed because I only gave this to uh, like a couple of little, little paragraphs. <laughs> Uh, upper limb, elbow needs 30 to 130, doesn't need full active extension, but it does need 30 to 130 because it's about getting your hand to your head, to your mouth and to, to uh, other places. One of the killer take home message was stiffness versus floppiness. Which do we want? We want stiffness and we don't want stiffness, but we'd much rather have stiffness than floppiness. Floppiness is what kills an upper limb. In fact, that's, that's true of the lower limb as well, of course, but floppiness of an elbow or wrist is absolutely paralyzed. You can't do anything with it. So a stiff strut is much better than a floppy thing with a great range of motion. Elbow instability. We talked about it being a dynamic thing. And again, listening to the patient. Uh, Dan, uh, Ben, I keep calling you Dan, why is that? Ben was, <laughs> ben was talking about listening to the patient, but it's also, how do you assess someone who's just dislocated their elbow? Um, massive medial bruising. A lateral, um, a lateral joint effusion, a seagull sign and, and fractures, the presence of fractures, they may be really subtle. They may look like little flecks or little, little how, do, oh, how can that possibly be relevant? Radial head injuries. That is the difference. Little coronoid avulsions or coronoid knockoffs, remember, they're different things. That is the difference between a simple dislocation and a complex dislocation. Complex is with fractures, simple is without fractures goes clunk back in and now you can get them moving. Finally, we talked about when, you, when you're correcting a, uh, 
when you're correcting an elbow default, an elbow uh, instability, a clockwise approach is what uh, Ben was talking about. Now he starts, and this and, uh, different surgeons may do different things, but here's an algorithm for you. Start with the anterior medial branch of the medial collateral ligament and the anterior capsule. That's where he's starting and, and addressing that knockoff of the coronoid, that anterior bit. Then you're moving around, going to the radial head. Then you're moving around to the UCL. And then if it's still unstable, you can start reconstructing the medial collateral if you want to. Um, but having a plan for elbow, elbow instability is, is the deal breaker. That was my summary of the session. And those two points at the top are probably the killer gorilla uh, uh, take homes, which we were uh, uh, thrashing last week as well. Speakers, anything to add to that that I've kind of missed out other than infection burning in the fires of regenerate? <laughs> Well done for putting that in at the end, Pete. That is the take-home message, yeah? <laughs> Operating a chef's hat, come up with some snappy phrases in Russian, you've got your immortality. <laughs> Smoke a cigar in theatre. Sorry? Yeah, Smoke a the... cigar in theatre. <laughs> One last thank you to our speakers. Cheers, guys. Alex, Nima, Ben, thank you so much. And uh, Mike in the back, just like making this all run smoothly. Thank you very much. Thanks cheers, guys. For attending, guys. Thanks, Thanks. Cheers, Pete. Cheers, Bye. Mike. Great talks, guys. Well done. Really good.